Hi class, it's Elizabeth. I'm sorry that I had to short you this in person, but I wanted you to have the nonverbal information so that you could do your nonverbal assignment. So we're gonna go over your eight choices for your types of nonverbal communication. And these are in no particular order, and it's not gonna look like eight because I'm gonna tell you which ones can be separated out. And then I'll go back over and at the end, I'll list the eight from which to choose. So the first one is haptics. Haptics is the use of touch. And we know some things about touch. We all know that babies need touch. And we are very um, quick to rock babies and nurture babies. And when I even was a parent of a premature baby, there was a um, technique called kangaroo care. And we were able to button our preemie baby David up in our shirts and um, have skin to skin contact with him while he was still in the NICU. There were nurses that did the same thing for babies that didn't have visitors. And what they found was that these babies, regardless of what you'd think, because they were in sterile environments, germ-free, uh, would have higher rates of infection out in the open air. They didn't. In fact, these babies that had skin to skin contact got out of the hospital quicker, which is better for insurance companies and better for families. And they grew faster. They had lower rates of infection. It was a win-win. So 17 years later, uh, kangaroo care is standard practice in, in premature NICU units. Um, but then we get a little bit older and we think, oh, you know, it's embarrassing to have our parents touch us and hug us in public. And, and we act like we get a little too big for touch. But what they found, even with people, adults who move away from their touch sensors, uh, let it, let's say that they get deployed or they take a job across the country and they, they move away, that your body will instinctively crave touch and you will seek out touch by bumping into people, letting a cashier's hand linger longer, and um, because touch is a need, a human physical need for people. Some things that they found is that compliance gaining or getting people to do what you want them to do increases when we use touch. They have found this on using a study on phone booths where they had some people just walk by the phone booth and say, hey, I need, and someone was standing outside asking for money and he just would say, hey, could I get a quarter? I need to make a phone call. And then the next group, he would touch them casually and say, hey, I need a quarter. Can I make a phone call? And uh, people would open up their wallets for the person who accompanied the request with touch. But you have to wonder if people were scared and just, you know, I'll open my wallet, I'll give you anything, just leave me alone. Um, or if that touch made it seem more sincere. I've had students in the serving industry that say that touching the table when they approach the table for reorders is standard practice and it, it usually gets more people to reorder drinks and thus creating a higher bill and bigger tips. So touch is a studied form of communication. Now, Number two is proxemics or use of space. An easy way to talk about this is proximity. If you live in close proximity to someone, you live close in space to them. But you have two choices under proxemics, and this could be your second and third nonverbal areas from which to choose. So you could talk about stationary space or space that st stays behind you that you could essentially lock up and call your own label. Um, your backpack, your house, your car, when you park your car in the parking lot and come to class, you expect that no one's going to open that car, sit on that car, you know, park close enough to touch that car because that's your car. We call that primary territoriality. Now, your desk in our class would be considered secondary territoriality. You are not entitled to that desk. Yes, your tuition dollars give you entitlement to a desk, but it could be any desk in that classroom. But have you seen people get pretty territorial about their desks in a classroom? I have. And then think about what you do when you have to buy a general admission ticket to an event. You have to get there early because you don't have any claim to a particular seat. That is considered public space. A second way to approach space is by talking about zones of personal space, or in other words, your personal bubble that moves with you as you move. Edward Hall broke this down into four different types of space. Zero to 18 inches is considered intimate, and the things that happen there are generally things that you invite people to do. 18 to 
18 inches to four feet is considered your personal space. And if you'd put a little highlight by that, um, at three and a half feet is the distance that most interpersonal communication occurs. Because that's a distance where you can have privacy, you don't have to talk that loudly, and other people will look at you as an identifiable unit. So you could be in conversation with someone and people wouldn't walk in between you because you're a noticeable dyad or couple. 4 to 12 feet is social distance, and 12 or more feet is public distance. Now, um, think about where you sit when you approach an open auditorium. A lot of that is dependent on your needs of space. And think about things that happen in your intimate space, maybe an elevator ride, maybe a dental visit. What do you do with your body to maximize the distance when you're in someone's intimate space? Sometimes people look away, avert eye contact. Sometimes people close their eyes. Uh, think about what your uh, approach to that would be. So the third type and your fourth choice for this assignment is kinesics. Think about kinesiology as the study of movement and kinesics is the use of your body. So this is essentially body language. Under it include five different types. Um, affect displays show emotions, so smiles and frowns, um, banging, you know, hitting a desk when you're upset, that's an affect display. Illustrators are simply movements that are attached to speech, such as pictures in a book, but the pictures do not substitute for the message. They need the words to have meaning because it could be used perhaps as a similar gesture. So if I uh, gesture with my hands and say, I caught a fish and it was this big, and you have to just imagine what I'm doing, um, showing the length of the fish, that whole movement could also be substituted for me saying, I can't believe you're not getting this information. And so the gesture didn't really mean anything. It just served to enliven that speech. Emblems, on the other hand, stand alone. So if you flip somebody off, that's an emblem. You don't need to say anything. It still has meaning. Adapters are things that satisfy physical needs. If you have an itch, you scratch it. If you need oxygen, you yawn. These are things that you want to minimize when you're at the podium because those get people's attention and they really aren't the message that you're trying to send an audience. And then regulators are the way that you know when it's your turn at conversation. Um, Another thing that you could factor out and make your fifth choice on this assignment is eye contact. Eye contact is under the umbrella of kinesics, but it's important enough that you could deal with it separately. The, um, you have an idea of what a normal gaze should be, and if it's too long, it feels awkward. If you're caught staring at someone, you avert your eyes quickly. Um, there's also a big science on eye, on mapping eye behavior, and um, sometimes juries will look at where witnesses look when they're on the stand because they can kind of ascertain truth and lying by where people look. Um, the next type of nonverbal is chronemics, which is use of time. And there are lots of ways you can look at time. One is precisely. So if you've ever had to punch a time clock, you know what precise time is. I've worked at places where they didn't discriminate whether it was 15 seconds late or 15 minutes late. The consequence was the same. Um, you know what it's like to miss a bus. I just missed a bus when I was traveling over the weekend. And I must have been 30 seconds late. But um, when things are working precisely, there's no time to be late. Psychological time is a different way to approach time. And it might be appropriate for your career. Because think about how much you have to factor in the past when you're placing a student in a next year's class. Or when you're prescribing uh, what might be a good health care regimen for someone who just has gotten, had surgery. You know, you need to factor in what's happened to this person before you tell them what exercises they should try. If someone has a past orientation, they have a good remembrance of the past. They know history. And it's good to be around people who know history because the point of studying history is that we don't have to constantly repeat the same mistakes. A present orientation is when people live for today. Carpe diem is the phrase. Um, and we know people who have died too soon and suspended enjoyment 
uh, and never really gotten to enjoy life. So a present orientation, you could make a case for, for doing that. Life is uncertain. A future orientation, there's some studies that say that colleges are filled with future-oriented people because there is somewhere that you would rather be than being in class or doing this lecture right now. But you've chosen to do your homework because you believe there's going to be a payoff, maybe in a better career choice, maybe by having more options, or maybe just by having uh, more understanding of the communication and the behaviors that people are demonstrating. Oh, and we must have skipped a five in the numbering, but that doesn't matter because these, these numbers aren't going to really affect what you do anyway. You're going to end up with eight choices, I promise. Artifactual communication could deal with the things that surround you, your clothing, the color of the room, um, what pictures you have in your office, um, if you've chosen to wear your power tie today, if uh, you decorate your apartment, or if you leave it kind of sterile because you're renting it. All of those artifacts are things that you can get clues about people based on what they choose to surround themselves with. When I was in sales, there was a lot of literature out that said, you know, go into a person's space and do an inventory. Look and see what's important to that person. And then strike up conversations about fishing if they have a stuffed fish that they've caught behind them. Or look at that as an option for where you could go conversationally. And the last nonverbal area that I'm going to cover is use of voice. Pair language is really important. It, um, in a speech situation, you can tell confidence based on how someone inflects. Uh, if they speak really quickly uh, versus slow and deliberately, we, we make assumptions based on people. And in fact, rate is the most studied aspect of speech. And people view faster speakers as having more to say, knowing more what they need to say. Um, I think you have to balance that because sometimes I think maybe they're talking fast to pull the wool over people's eyes. But generally, studies have shown that audiences gauge and judge faster speakers as having more knowledge and credibility. Um, you know my pet peeve about inflection, and that would fall under paralanguage. So think about um, if, if I were doing this assignment, I would cover something about having a teacher voice so that everyone in the room can understand and hear what the teacher is giving directions and things like that. If I were talking about a nurse, I might be um, thoughtful of HIPAA violations and lower my volume when I'm giving information to a patient that is private and that they wouldn't want other people to hear. So let's review what your eight choices are. The first choice is haptics. Second is proxemics territoriality. Third is proxemics halls, zones of space. Fourth is kinesics, use of body, gestures, those kind of things. Fifth is kinesics, eye contact. Sixth is chronemics, or use of time. Seven is artifactual communication, or your things. And eighth is the use of your voice. Paralanguage, another word for paralanguage is vocalics. Pick five of those eight areas and talk about how you should behave to be an effective worker in whatever area you've determined, whether it be computer science, being a policeman, um, being a therapist. Pick the five areas that you think most relate to that career choice and prescribe three behaviors that will lead to effective outcomes in that area based on your use of nonverbal communication. Good luck. I'm around for questions. Let me know if you have any.